I'm hanging off the edge of a 300 foot tall cliff with a team of scientists, all for the sake of the next botany adventure on Plants Are Cool Too. Plants are cool too. What's up everybody, this is Chris Martin and welcome to Plants Are Cool Too. Today we're in central Pennsylvania in the Susquehanna River Valley where the north branch of the river meets the west branch. Behind me are the Shikalemi Bluffs, one of the finest cliffside habitats in all of eastern North America. There's a group of biologists up there doing a biodiversity survey. We're going to go join them and find out what's so special about this habitat. Scott! Nice to see you again. Hey, Chris. How you doing, man? All right. We are way up here. Yeah, about 300, 360 feet. What are you doing up here today? I'm up here collecting plants off of this amazing cliff face. Uh, we're looking for Corydalus aurea, uh -huh. which is a rare uh, Corydalus that yep. grows only on this cliff. And that's what they call it, golden Corydalus? Golden Corydalus, yeah. yeah. Okay. I work with the Pennsylvania Natural Heritage Program, yep. and we track rare, threatened, and endangered species all over the state. And the rare corydalus that we're looking for is only known from this cliff this in all of Pennsylvania. The one place in the, the entire state? The one place in the entire state. But is it common in other parts of the country? We probably could find it in central New York, okay. uh, New Hampshire, Vermont, and that's about it. That's about it. Um, this so particular plant. Is there something pretty similar to it here that um, we might also run into? Yes, yes okay. there is. Uh, there's yellow corydalus, which we have a, a sample of. Okay. Um, and this is and a different species. It's a different but species. Similar. Yep, yeah. this is Corydalus flavula. Flavula. And it's very similar. Uh, the flowers are bright yellow. And the main difference between this and the, the golden Corydalus is yeah. that yellow Corydalus has these teeth yeah. on the top of the flower. Okay. Golden Corydalus is smooth over the top of the flower. Okay, so we'd expect to see this here in, in all sorts. Like, like, how many more places in Pennsylvania would you find that? You would find this on just about any roadside where it's kind of rocky. Okay. I mean, this is a common right. spring to early summer wildflower. It's quite beautiful. It's yeah. striking. People yeah. love it. So we expect to see some of this, but what we really hope for is to get a hold of this rare plant. I mean, if we know it's here already, then what, what's, what are you doing the survey for? So we're doing the survey to try and get an idea why it's here. Okay. All right. So why is it down here and nowhere else in Pennsylvania? Yep. And is this a relic population? Was it brought in somehow by birds or transportation? There used to be a rail line down below, uh -huh. and rail lines are notorious for moving plants across the country yep. inadvertently. We can't really walk down there and do it, so yeah. how do we survey this habitat for the rare plant? We've got a couple of guys out there on ropes right now, and they've been up one time, and they've brought me bryophytes primarily, mm -hmm. and then they found this one thinking that's what it was. Yep. And so, they're out there collecting and they're looking for it right now as we speak. Despite recent estimates that there were something like 50 individuals of the rare golden corydalus on this cliff, our team was unable to find a single plant in the early going, but certainly not for lack of trying. After several hours of searching by rope, Scott scrambled down to a new area and noticed a yellow flower that just might be what we were looking for. We decided to look for another place to uh, try and find this flower and popped on down here. This is a popular hangout for people and I leaned over the fence and I saw this golden yellow flower kind of underneath an overhang over here. And I was going to go out on my own to get it, but Jay wisely told me that it would be better to tie in with some ropes. So. He's tying in, he's going to go down about five feet and look around to see if there's some other uh, plants down there for us to collect and see if this might be the, the rare Corydalus aurea. So is the flower top rounded or does it have tiny teeth or lobes on it? They look a little bit toothed. They look a little bit toothed. Okay. It was beginning to look like this plant was more rare than we had imagined or worst case had disappeared from this site, and indeed all of Pennsylvania, before we had a chance to find it. Day two arrived and our climbers continued to search other parts of the cliffs where the species had been seen before. But I have to admit, I was starting to wonder if our collective faith in the mission had begun to waver. Of course, I was wrong about that. 
So your job is looking for rare plants, but why does it matter whether we find them? Why do we need to know where they are? Rare plants like neat places. I like to say it that way. Mm -hmm. So a neat cliffside like this probably harbors several rare plants. And because of its unique habitat, only certain plants can grow there, making them restricted in, in where they can grow. Yeah. yeah. As opposed to common plants, non-rare plants, if you want to say that, they don't have a whole lot of habitat preference. And so they can grow wherever there's available habitat for them. Mm -hmm. And whereas the rare plants really like neat places like cliffs or bogs or caves yeah. or things like that. So. Right. so understanding something about those rare plants might help us understand the unusual habitats they grow in, mm -hmm. help us protect those. Right? right. And what happens if we lose that rare habitat? So when that rare habitat goes, so to the plant usually they would go extirpated from a site. So, okay. vers you know, the species wouldn't go extinct, but they would be removed from a site. Yep. And, okay. and, and in Pennsylvania, it, losing this site would mean losing the species in the state for good. Right, exactly. No, we don't want that and to happen. We don't want that to happen. Luckily for the community of species inhabiting these cliffs, Scott and I aren't the only people who don't want that to happen. For the last few years, a partnership led by the local Merrill Lynn Land and Waterways Conservancy and spearheaded by volunteers like retired Bucknell professor Warren Abrahamson successfully purchased the land rights to unprotected sections of the cliffs and transferred them to the state park so that they can be protected and enjoyed in their natural state for generations to come. Now, if only we could confirm that the golden corridalis was one of the things they had saved. Well. I don't think we got anything of interest. No. <laughs> uh, it's a lot of uh, a lot of what you see here, which is nice, but uh, I don't think we got anything we're looking for. Find it? I don't think we did. Maybe we saw some babies that weren't flowering, but uh, there's no way to get a positive confirmation on that at all. So, jury's still out. We had encountered all sorts of cool specimens over the course of two days, but still not the one we had come for. So the decision was made to try one last strategy. Instead of coming from the top down, let's see what happens when we go from the bottom up. We're looking for 13 to 16 millimeters flower length that includes the spur of four to five millimeters. Four millimeters. Dude, that's it. Woo! Hey, we got it! it. We found it! <laughs> Why are we now collecting leaf material from all the, the individuals that we're finding? Well, we're trying to understand the genetic diversity of this population of golden corridalis. And that has two things that we're looking for. We're trying to understand if there is a good amount or a high amount of genetic diversity in this population just in Pennsylvania. And also, how does this population compare to other populations in the states to the north of here? Some might say that it looks like we're harming this population by taking parts of the leaves out of here, but is that necessarily true? It could be easily interpreted like that, but actually we're not harming the plants. Um, we're taking just a small sample of a leaf material that will be used for DNA analyses. And these analyses actually will give us a ton of information for which we can use to develop another way or other methods to uh, help this population remain stable or perhaps even grow in the future. So a little bit of leaf material removed today could help save the species in Pennsylvania tomorrow. It could, yeah. yeah. Well, Scott, we've uh, done a lot of hard work out here, but we've also had a ton of fun. Yeah, we sure did. Had a great time scrambling around on the cliffs looking for this plant. And I want to just tell you that it was a great opportunity and that heritage biologists all over the country do this kind of work day in and day out. And we do it because we have a passion for protecting biodiversity where we live. And you know, we don't get paid a lot of money, but we make a decent living doing the thing we love. And that's really important. 
I'm glad that you're doing it. So thanks for your hard work. Yeah, and any- th- Normally, this is where our episode would end, but this story took another amazing turn. Remember what Scott said about why these cliffs were such a neat place? A neat cliffside like this probably harbors several rare plants. plants. Well, it turns out we had been seeing one of those rare plants all day long without realizing what it was. And it took Twitter to help us figure that much out. At some point, while most of the other biologists were dangling off the cliff, I tweeted a photo of what I thought was a species called Heuchera americana, or American alum root, a rather common wild cousin of the immensely popular garden plants often called coral bells. Well, ding dong, I was wrong. Soon after my tweet, the post garnered a response from Heuchera expert Ryan Folk, who said it was probably another species, Heuchera alba, a globally imperiled wildflower that had previously only been recorded from small populations in the far-off mountains of Virginia and West Virginia. Not realizing that seeing this rare species in Pennsylvania was even a possibility, our crew had been blindly bumping into it since we started our surveys. Like... Here, here, and right here. And when we went and examined specimens collected in this area over the last 100 years, we came to realize that all sorts of botanists had been missing this species in Pennsylvania for over a century, even though it was right under our noses. That is, as long as your nose was hanging over a particular kind of very steep cliff. All this is to say, but there are still a lot of things left to discover in this world, especially when scientists and other lovers of nature come together, whether face-to-face or across electronic platforms. But the real key is protecting those special places where the cool things live. Just like the Maryland Conservancy, Shikalemi State Park, and all of their partners have done on the Shikalemi Bluffs. So here's to habitat conservation and backyard exploration. And... For real this time, thanks for watching. Plants are cool too. Coming up! Hey guys! Guys? Scott! Charlie! Jason! Coming up! Funding for Plants Are Cool Too is made possible by the Pennsylvania Natural Heritage Program, the President's Fund, and the David Burpee Endowment at Bucknell University.